Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, session today, having a career talk with our guest speaker, Rashid Al Hosani. On behalf, my name is Iba Abbasi, and on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center team, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to join us today. We are very delighted to have with us today our guest, speaker, Rashid Al Hosani. Rashid is the commercial director at Makta Gateway, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Abu Dhabi Ports and a central pillar of the company's strategy to be at the vanguard of integrated digital global trade. As commercial director, he is responsible for developing and driving commercial strategies that will induce sustainable growth and enable Makta Gateway to take its place among the top trade facilitation companies around the world. Mr. Al Hosnani is an experienced and focused leader who brings to Makta Gateway a wealth of commercial knowledge and experience with a particular focus on information and communication technology. Over the past decade, he served in a number of senior roles within the MENA region, which position, positions him well to help Makta Gateway deliver on its core vision and corporate goals. Specifically, as a regional director for Middle East and Central Asia at the Thureya Telecommunications Company, he developed regional sales strategies for service partners and key stakeholders across diverse markets and geographies. Furthermore, he also served as a commercial manager at the Aliyah Satellite Communications Company, Yasad, for over five years, where he headed a team of country managers and oversaw business development activities in more than 20 nations in the African region. Mr. Al Hosani began his career at Dubai World, where, among other roles, he served as an assistant manager of business development. While at the company, he was responsible for designing and negotiating commercial proposals with government partners and agencies, which included maritime ports and free zones, an experience which gave him first-hand exposure to the maritime section. Rashid, it's a pleasure to have you with us today and uh, to have the experience that you have shared with our community of students and alumni. So welcome to our session. Uh, before we start the session, I'd just like to remind our attendees and audience that um, if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in the question section and we will be taking them either through the session or towards the end of the session. So um, my first question to you, and uh, I'm sure that everybody would love to know if you can tell us a little bit about how you started your career journey and how it has developed to come where you are right now as a commercial director at Makta Gateway. Assalamu uh, alaikum, first of all, and uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Deba uh, and uh, Manchester University. It's an honor for me to be here uh, in our second uh, event. And uh, inshallah, I hope this session will be useful uh, for all the attendees. Um, so uh, further to what you mentioned about my career, uh, Heba, I, uh, I did my um, undergraduate degree in business information systems uh, in, in Australia, Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So obviously when I came back from, uh, from my studies uh, in 2010, I was uh, hoping to find a job within the domain that I studied to apply whatever I learned over the years. As, as any graduate would have. Now, um, I was lucky enough to get a job uh, within, I would say, two months uh, since I came back. And I'll talk more about how you can get uh, quicker responses on, on opportunities. That's, that's something that we're yeah. going to talk into. <laughs> we'll talk about that a bit more later. Uh, but I was lucky to find a job uh, as a business analyst, um, which is exactly what I studied uh, in, my, in my degree. Uh, and the career progression was to become a project manager after that. Now, to my surprise, um, I, I quickly learned that um, uh, having a more back office kind of role and um, uh, more uh, work on, the, I would say, computer and modeling processes and uh, preparing documentation, all these things, wasn't quite my passion. You know, I, 
I was more of an extrovert and I like dealing with the stakeholders and customers more. Although that is a part of the role of the business analyst and, and certainly it's a very important one. But I, I saw myself leaning more towards the other side. And um, the management at my first company uh, in Dubai World uh, called Dubai Trade, they realized the same, uh, that I had, uh, uh, I would say, more skills related to communication and handling customers. And I, I had some sort of uh, commercial or strategic sense that could be applied in a different role. And obviously, I, I saw an opportunity at the company where they were trying to grow the business development department, and I applied. So um, I, I quickly transitioned into a role of uh, business development. And that's where I, I pivoted uh, rather than continued uh, in my original path. Now, commercial and sales and business development was not really part of my studies. So yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's where you have to be sometimes flexible in life to capitalize on opportunities. Uh, you shouldn't be so rigid. Uh, just to say, no, you know, I studied this and I have to work on this because times change, opportunities change and and you just have to uh, pivot when you have when when it's the right time. So I, that's where I mean to pivot, to pivot within the same company. Uh, yes, because I had already established uh, the right rapport, uh, the management and different departments. I left on good terms with my with my first line manager to the second line manager. So that's also important. Um, and I also built a overall understanding of the business. So I understood what was required of me. Um, and that's what made it easier to move. Now, uh, fast forward uh, some time and I got my opportunity to completely change, not even roles, but sectors. Um, so that was after just under three years of staying at Dubai Trade. Um, where I got an opportunity to join a satellite company called Alia, satellite communications company. Yeah. Now, a lot of people thought it was highly unusual for someone to pivot, such a pivot, you know, from trade and logistics to satellite. Yeah. And there were skeptics, you know, from both sides. Uh, but, I, you know, for me, I had to follow my guts and my instincts. Um, and uh, the gut feeling was this is for the better. So I, uh, again, I left on good terms. So it was a changing uh, industries. Yes, yes. I mean, it was, it was risky. Uh, I mean, would I be able to prove myself again? Would I build the same rapport? Would I have the same success? You know, it's not, nothing is guaranteed. Starting over, you know, but again, when you're, when you're young and uh, you've only had a few years experience, it's okay to start over easily. It's not that difficult. So I made the move. And I took it as a challenge to prove to both sides, whether my new colleagues in Yasat or my previous colleagues, that I can I can do this, you know, and I can be successful. And if you fast forward there as well, alhamdulillah, um, I managed to reach from an account manager to a regional director in just a couple of years. Um, and uh, and even within my new role of Yasat, I moved from an account manager to a commercial manager to a regional sales director. So. And I worked in uh, the Middle East, Asia, Central Asia, and Africa. So I had a wide variety of experience, and I never said no to any challenge or opportunity that I got. So there's a common pattern that you might see in my career where I, I made strategic moves and changes, not necessarily uh, from one organization to the other, but even within the same organization. You have to know where the where the focus is, where the investment is, where the interest is, where the management uh, need support. And so I spent uh, just under six years uh, at Yasat slash Toreya, uh, because Toreya was acquired by Yasat. Um, and um, then I moved again to my previous industry, which is uh, almost like destined uh, to go back and work on a similar kind of concept and project, but a much wider scale and uh, scope. Um, about this time for the government of Abu Dhabi, all benefiting the, the United Arab Emirates. So at the end of the day, you know, we're serving our country, whether we're in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. And uh, again, people were skeptical and they were thinking, oh, again, you will change and completely different. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, uh, it was a calculated move. 
uh, again, you ask your question, you, you ask yourself whether you should pivot or persevere in life. And um, the more you reflect and the more you weigh things, uh, the clearer it will be for you to make such decisions. And Alhamdulillah, you know, I've been here now uh, a year and uh, a couple of months uh, in Makta Gateway and Abdul Ports. And uh, we are uh, growing strong um, and uh, moving ahead. That's great. Rashid, I can see throughout your career trajectory that you have made uh, a couple of moves. First of all, you've made lateral moves within the same company and you jumped into different roles. And then also you took a risk and you changed industry. First of all, which one you think was more challenging for you and um, you had to perhaps apply more skills and adapt uh, more quickly in order to fit in the, the, the culture? What was more challenging for you? I mean, for me, I have a, uh, each experience was unique and I wouldn't say one was more challenging than the other, but what helped me was um, I'm used to traveling and adapting to different cultures and peoples and mindsets. So that helped me in my career as well. So my international upbringing helped me with my international experience at work. So whether I was in Africa or Iraq, it didn't really matter, you know? Um, I, could, I could quickly adapt to my new assignment and to the stakeholders or customers that I had to deal with. It's a formula, you know, of, of adaptability and flexibility. and. Um, uh, having that deeply rooted in you from a young age uh, certainly helps. Absolutely. Talking about these skills, what are, in your opinion, some of the top skills that um, you know employers value most in candidates? And I know that you are in a position where you sometimes are hiring for the company and looking for roles and looking for candidates. So if you um, were to look at the top skills that you look for in candidates and employers, look, what would these skills be? Well, um, Eba, I think um, there are certain common principles or uh, formulas that can be applied in any industry or in any job interview. Um, one is there are candidates that demonstrate the ability uh, to be delivery oriented. You know, some people are um, very focused on results and will get the job done. And this this spawns from their, um, their desire to learn and to not settle for not knowing something. So this, this hunger for, and thirst for knowledge, and if I don't know how to do it, I'll learn how to do it. And if, if and there's a deadline, there's a target, there's, they'll know how to uh, be delivery oriented. So this, this kind of uh, skill or attribute is attractive to employers, you know? So the um, learnability, the ability to, to learn new things and upskill at, at, uh, at any time. Yeah, and, at the, and to be results oriented, you know? It's, it's mm. this mindset, I wouldn't say it's a skill, it's a mindset, I guess, uh, that some people have and it's attractive. So I, I wouldn't say any particular technical skills are so attractive to an employer, it's more about attitude and mindset. Uh, this is what people care about the most. Obviously, um, having worked in um, reputable organizations or within the domain that we're hiring is important and can be a core uh, requirement for, for the job. But if you have the right attitude, uh, it, it, it takes you a long way. Um, and I think we talked about this before Hiba, uh, in an interview. Uh, uh, employers and especially highly intelligent people uh, can sense genuine genuinity if you are genuine or not you know so if you're not authentic you're not genuine you have not developed yourself uh, to articulate and promote yourself without being uh, fake you know as they say uh, yeah. you will not do it with employers you know absolutely authenticity Yes. Is one of the, the, the key value. And, and it's funny that you mentioned that because I was reading a post for Simon Sinek and he said about, I know that how employers value top skills and one of the top skills may be flexibility, adaptability, learnability, but he also said it's key that you have the right attitude and the right mindset. So perhaps skills can be learned, but you should have initially intrinsic within you um, uh, this, the, the right attitude and the right mindset uh, to learn any skill. Um, yes, so also, uh, I would like to add, Hibbe, um, 
one thing which is hard to gauge initially and only comes after time is uh, demonstrating a high sense of morality. And uh, high intelligence is not equivalent to high morality. You have some very highly intelligent people, but they are not very moral. And um, you don't want to create an environment where you don't trust the people you work with. Um, so so uh, demonstrating that kind of high morality is also very attractive for employers. But again, these are the things you cannot really show from day one. It comes with time and it helps you in your career progression. Absolutely. So um, in your role as, as a commercial director, and I, I'm sure you do get a lot of CVs, um, you know, for some of the roles that you're hiring for. Um, what would you say is the most important element of the resume? When you look at the CV, what is the, the first thing that you look for? Well, um, I'll be very honest with you, but I don't spend too much time on the CV, but I only skim. And uh, that's why my advice is always uh, put the major headlines, um, where you've worked, in what capacity, for how long, you know? These kind of main things that someone would like to skim and see. But uh, I think the true assessment happens during the interview or a phone call. Or people want to think, people, I mean, employers want to know what you, th how you think, how your thought, uh, what's your mindset, um, what's your thinking process, you know, you, the way you think. So um, being able to articulate is also very important. Sometimes you have very talented people uh, but they struggle with the verbal communication, with the body language, with the, so they can be misunderstood. Um, so working on the way you present yourself is very important uh, for, for recruitment. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you recommend that they practice before they come to the interview? Definitely. Um, even me, at, you know, um, uh, any, I, I never change this formula for me before I go into a meeting or an interview or anything, I rehearse scenarios in my mind. And yeah. by nature, I am very reflective. I like to reflect a lot, um, do the devil's advocate on myself, um, put myself in the position of the other side. This way you come up with creative uh, thought processes and questions, and you can prepare much better for an interview. It's good that you mentioned that a lot of people don't reflect on, on their career journey or don't reflect on the kind of work that they're doing. And I think it's really important that each and every one of us just spends time, and especially now that we're you know, heading towards December and it's the end of the year, we've gone through a lot this year. Um, I think it's really important to take some time off and to reflect about our career journey. If we're going to an interview, reflect about you know, what were some of the projects that we have done, what are we going to um, do next? And it's kind of uh, important for our next step. Um, when looking at these candidates, what are some of the challenges that you face when you are trying to hire for, you know, when you're looking for the right talent? Um, what are some of the challenges that you face in finding the right, right talent? for the positions that you're recruiting for? Well, uh, there's a host of challenges, especially when you work uh, in a very niche industry. Um, mm -hmm. So digital trade and logistics is very niche, and especially in the region. So it's hard to find talent that are locally based. Um, and especially during this crisis, it's very difficult to bring people from abroad. So, and this is why I always, uh, you know, I stress- You have local my, talent. Yes, I mean, but very few within our space. Um, and within digital trade and logistics is very niche. Uh, and this is why I always, uh, you know, have this dialogue with some of the universities uh, that the, the curriculums need to reflect the reality of the current job market. So I don't see many universities um, having um, like graduates uh, in digital transformation or AI or machine learning or these things. I mean, some people are still studying the traditional jobs and that works for some sectors and industries but I mean for us it's we're looking for very specialized people and most of them are, are based abroad and even abroad it's hard to find them uh, so it's very very difficult and especially when you're trying to even bring up the local Emiratis um, it's even harder and harder to find Emiratis that have uh, studied or have some sort of experience or are willing to go into the sector 
Uh, but there are, and we are seeing a lot of improvement there. Now we have uh, a group of young Emirati females um, that are working on software development for our uh, biggest project, uh, which is the Advanced Trade Logistics Platform uh, that's mandated by the government of Abu Dhabi. So we have young local Emirati women uh, developers working on it. It's something we're very proud of. Um, so we are, we are getting there, but it's challenging. It is challenging. Uh, another uh, challenge, uh, which is more general, not really related to us, is you know knowing that you have the right person from day one. Uh, I mean, some people are very good at interviews, or they make a beautiful CV, but then yeah. you discover slowly, you know, uh, that they're not quite the right fit. And sometimes, sometimes it's about uh, getting the right people in the right seat. So they might not be completely uh, not useful. But they're in the wrong position or wrong seat and that's also a problem so i mean i would say recruitment and hiring and fitting are very complicated things that should not be taken lightly and the success of an organization is having getting these things right okay um i know that some of the organizations are uh, adopting the reskilling and up upskilling um strategies so if if you find a person if you hired someone who is in a certain position um, so is, do you think that the companies now are willing to maybe uh, invest in an employee to kind of upskill them or reskill them so that they know how to do the job or a certain task um, that they don't know or they don't have experience or they don't have the skill for? Do you think that some of the companies are willing to do the reskilling and um, upskilling or, um, or you see a trend that companies, if they hire someone who is not who does not fit the role, it's better than to just, you know, perhaps let them go and look for the right candidate. What is your view on this? Would you uh, advocate for the reskilling and upskilling, or would you think that no, if this is not a good candidate, then perhaps we should perhaps let them go and look for the right one? I think uh, that's a very good question, Eba, and um, it's it's not black and white. So if if you're hiring for a junior position, then absolutely. You know, it's it's a company's duty is to upskill that that person. You have to have um, very comprehensive trainings, uh, shadowings, uh, mentorship. You know, ex uh, like programs to take care of the fresh graduates, the the lower quadrant of the employee hierarchy. But if you're hiring someone like a manager or a senior manager or someone who's who who's supposedly has experience and is coming now to help you deliver so they're coming to be plug and play you know yes they might need some time to adjust they might need to learn your business and but there's a certain level of expectation that's minimal um, with the mid-level uh, management and above so i think that's the dis distinguish yeah yeah so depending on the role and depending on the job description that uh really yeah. seniority depending on the seniority, the seniority. Of the role. right yes mm -hmm. um so when you look at, at a resume, I know that there are millions of people without jobs now, and we will see lots of gaps in the CV. Um, how would you recommend that people, uh, first of all, what is your take when looking at a resume and seeing that there's a gap of six months or maybe nine months or one year? Uh, would you advise that the candidate leaves this gap and perhaps maybe justify that this gap is due to a job loss because of the pandemic or it? Or any other reason, or would you recommend that they just take them out and, and just don't mention them except when they come to the interview? Uh, what is your take on this? Do you think they should keep the gap in the CV and uh, perhaps mention why, or just leave it to the interview? Well, I think um, there's no right or wrong answer, but I'll, I'll give you my take on this. Um, if a person is honest about their situation and uh, due to uh, factors beyond their control, they've lost their job or have a gap in their CV, then I think uh, a fair employer should should be able to look past that. Um, so I think being honest about these kind of gaps and um, uh, I would say being transparent is, is helpful, especially, I mean, for me, I, I don't see it as a negative thing if it's due to a crisis, which is beyond their control or like a family, sometimes family emergencies or situations dictate yeah. that a person cannot, needs to leave their job for a while. So I think depending on the reasoning um, and why that person has a gap, I mean, was that person fired from their role? 
was that person, uh, I mean, fired because of their performance or because of their attitude or, uh, you know, or because, uh, wallahi, there is a uh, cost cutting and downsizing and it's very different reasoning. So I think uh, some employers have that flexibility to, to uh, look into the reason and if it's something beyond the control, then it's fair enough, you know, uh, you cannot blame someone for something beyond their control. Absolutely. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to take a question from one of our uh, uh, attendees. Uh, Ola is asking, I think the most uh, of the MENA region face toxic work environment. How can you overcome that in your work when you work in a place where there is a toxic work environment in your career? And what advice would you give to managers uh, who kind of do that thing to their employees? So we're talking about the toxic work environment. What is your advice to employees who live in that toxic work environment? And if they have a manager who's not really helpful, uh, I know that we're talking maybe about the company culture and uh, talking about how can you navigate relationships with your manager, with your line manager, especially if they're not really motivating you or pushing you towards your career goals. Well, that's a, actually, that's a big problem that many people face, Ahiba. Uh, and for me, it's, it's very simple. If, I mean, if the culture is toxic and if the environment is toxic, then I would simply find the fastest way out the door. You know, I, I, I wouldn't want to waste my life or time in a place where the culture is, is toxic uh, because you spend how many hours a day, every day in the workplace, you know? Some people At spend 12 hours a day. Yeah, some people go up to 12, 15 hours in the same. So if you're not enjoying your work and you are not, you don't feel respected or appreciated in the place you are in, yes, there'll be tough times, you know? Long hours, yeah. uh, tough meetings, harsh work, but if overall the environment is toxic, then you need to find a way out. Um, and I know sometimes because of, you know, life uh, that you have to, uh, be patient and uh, you know maybe the opportunities are not out there so you just have to um, uh, hang in there um, and uh, just keep in mind that one day you will be out of this place and you have to try your best to secure another job so you have to be very active about changing your career I would say never be passive about such things uh, when there's toxicity uh, don't ignore it uh, because it will take a toll on your health and your mentality and you will never flourish or grow in such a place. And now to the other side, the toxic managers, I would say, um, I think there is this misunderstanding of, they think um, if you are aggressive and if you beat your employees down and if you create this unhealthy competition among people that you will generate results. You might get short-term results, but nothing sustainable. And you will not build that. Um, the admiration or loyalty with the employees you will not extract the best out of them um, you know uh, there's a Machiavellian saying where um, you, uh, you know a leader should uh, should be loved and feared you know not just feared but unfortunately Machiavelli goes uh, goes on to says if you can't be loved then you should be feared but I don't advocate <laughs> I don't advocate that and, and, I, and I, I'm a firm believer that if your people do not love you, then there's a problem. Yes, they might fear you a little bit because you are firm, but you have to be fair as well. So having this balance of, um, you know, not letting it be completely a loose environment, laissez, too laissez-faire, I would say, and not making it a very unpleasant place for people to work. Um, and people respond to these things. You know, this is a, a, a story as old as time, carrot and stick, love and fear. It's you know, it's <laughs> since we are creative. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say for these managers, don't be so sh uh, yeah, any short-sighted. Look at the long term. Think about the culture you are building. Think about the, the legacy you are leaving. You know, and it's uh, life is 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 not about short-term gains. I think uh, the idea about the workplace it has changed and developed a lot, uh, especially now during the COVID nineteen. Uh, situation since March, we've seen that people 
demand more flexibility, demand more, uh, you know, to be valued in the workplace, demand uh, a lot of these things. And I think, uh, you know, in the UAE, some of the companies are becoming leaders in this. So they understand that um, the importance of flexibility, they understand the value of keeping their employee happy in order to be to be able to do their work and to give to the company. Um, what do you think uh, about the culture of, you know, uh, flexibility in the workplace? And is it something that is it going to become perhaps the new norm going now forward? And since that, you know, COVID-19 has proved that people can do their work anywhere, anytime. Um, is this something that we can perhaps see in the future? More flexibility, more flexible kind of work, less hours, more flexible hours. What's your uh, take on that? Yes, I think uh, long gone are the days where, you know, you have like the factory mentality, assembly line mentality, where you just clock in and you clock out and you push the buttons and you leave at the same time. And we need to evolve beyond this. For me, even um, if my team is delivering uh, what I ask them to or what's expected from them uh, by the company, I don't care honestly where you are, you know, Ayani. Um, yes, you need to attend the meetings. You have a certain minimal hours that you need to do. But at the end of the day, it's all about what you're delivering. And the more you deliver, the less people ask you questions. So why put yourself in that situation where someone will check your attendance sheet? And you know what I mean, Yanni? Only the low performers or people who don't care. And uh, those are the people who are you know, uh, being uh, held accountable for their uh, physical presence or all this kind of thing. So, I mean, flexibility, I think it, it inspires and it drives um, innovation because um, if, you're, if your employees are more comfortable, you know, uh, and they're more comfortable at working at home or they love to come to the office or, you know, it depends on, on what's more comfortable for them. If, if, if they work out of that kind of mindset and comfort, they will give you more. They'll deliver more rather than you making uh, the environment very unpleasant and forcing them to work within certain constraints. So. I think the more you give the tools of, of any comfort to the employees, they'll give you more. The more you give them, they'll give you. And this is what I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely, I believe so too. So we have a question uh, from the audience that is asking, when is it too late to switch or change career path uh, throughout your career journey? And uh, is age related to it? Like, for instance, if you hit 40, you cannot change. If you hit 50, you cannot change. Um, yeah. What is your uh, point on that? I mean, if, if, and also I want to ask you about ageism. This is um, something which is people, I mean, rarely talk about. If you receive a CV for someone who is 50 years old, would you say that it's too late for him? Why should I hire him? or would you still be looking for certain skills? So let's first take a look at the first portion of the question, which is, when is it too late to switch or change career path? And my next, next question is about ageism and um, related to career job and hiring and recruitment. Okay. Look, I would never say that it's too late. I mean, this is too definitive, uh, but I would say it's easier to switch uh, given certain realities. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If you studied uh, petrochemical engineering and you've worked in petrochemical engineering and now suddenly you want to move, it's kind of more difficult for you to go into something else without, um, you know, uh, settling for a lower position or having to go back to school to study something else, maybe an MBA or whatever. An MBA, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It will take um, you anywhere you want to go. <laughs> yes, uh, Bayani, yes, sometimes it's more difficult for certain people. Um, but let's say uh, you studied, let's say, sales, and uh, you've worked in an international company, you've built uh, a good experience and network, and now you want to change from selling uh, software to selling, let's say, uh, cars, for example. Yeah. I think you, you, by then you would have built some generic skill sets that you can take anywhere with you, you know, uh, how to deal with customers, how to market a product, 
how to, you know, these things are common skills you can take the with you. transferable skills that you can take with you. Transferable anyway. skills, yes. So depending on how specific your experience and uh, education is, it will determine how easy it is for you to switch. Now, uh, the win and uh, the ageism, um, I mean, again, this is all subjective because some employers do look at age as, oh, no, this person, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know, this kind of mentality. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but there is this perception that older people are more rigid and harder to teach uh, new skill sets. But Anna, for me, I don't look at age. And I look at the, the person in front of me. You know, If that person is able to demonstrate the ability to be flexible and to learn and to pivot, then I don't mind. You know, um, I want the person to be valuable to me. Uh, whether they're uh, you know uh, young or old or it doesn't matter to me I and mean, i don't think there is anything uh, like that that's objectively uh, a hindrance you know for someone right. to switch over yes again if you spend 20 years in a certain field with a certain job with, yes it makes it more difficult for you to pivot absolutely absolutely um I'm trying to look at the questions here. Um, also, we have questions related to kind of what if it, what if you have uh, a manager who is less qualified than you and who's not, <laughs> you know, leading the team in the way that they're supposed to? Uh, should you stay in that job? How should you react to this manager? What is your take on this? This is something, again, that's very common, and uh, you can see it in a lot of places. But I would say, if you are more competent than your manager, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, it depends on your manager if that manager is malicious or not. So some managers uh, will take that as a positive thing, and they'll rely on you. And thus, you will get more exposure, you will learn more, you will take a leadership role, um, effectively, you will do, be doing their job, you know, and it will, which will help you to move up into that position one day. And uh, you can find some managers that are like that, but they're also willing to let you shine, to bring you up to the uh, top management and uh, give you credit for your work. So again, it depends on the maliciousness or, uh, of your, your manager. Um, the managers come in all shapes and, and forms, and you like a box, <laughs> like a box of chocolates, uh, as Tom Hanks uh, said. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, yeah, don't be demotivated if you are better than your manager, if you're more knowledgeable than them. It could be actually a blessing in disguise for you to learn more and to be exposed more to the upper ups. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to encourage you, if you have questions related to the topic, please do ask them. Any other questions which is related to certifications or university, um, you can um, ask it to the, go to the university website and ask these questions. Um, we have a question here and it, they're asking, um, is it worthwhile to apply to part-time work if even if you ultimately want full-time work, but you're unable to find that, would you recommend that people uh, go for part-time work until perhaps they find the full-time work? What is your advice on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're unable to find full-time work, then at least uh, keep yourself busy and learning in a part-time capacity. And when an employer is looking to hire you, at least showing that you have some sort of employment now gives you more value actually than someone who's out of a job. So it's not a bad thing and there's no shame in having part-time work. And especially if you need the money and you know you have a lot of responsibilities, so you should not just sit there at home and wait for a uh, full-time employment. Take whatever you can get. And um, yeah, there's no Even shame in that. Even if it's not related to your uh, perhaps uh to your field or to your skill set, is it okay for these people to try and take on these part-time jobs, uh, even if they're not related to their industry? I mean, yes. Um, again, it depends on how severe your situation is. So um, depending on the leverage you have, of course, you wouldn't want to settle for something lower if you don't have to. So you need to, you need to be honest with yourself and with your situation. Am I able to secure something within my field 
in a full-time capacity in the short term? The answer is yes, then hold out. You know? If not, then you keep going, settling for less and less and less. You just have to be realistic about your self-worth, the current uh, job environment, and what is feasible, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. We have a question here, and it's about the recruitment uh, process. Um, they're saying that, you know, I've applied to many job boards and career post portals in companies, but they never get back to me. Is there something, as an insider, what's your uh, recommendation for these people applying for companies on job boards? We do understand that there's the ATS, the applicant uh, tracking system, which kind of filters the applications. Oh, so what's your advice for these people applying for career portals uh, on certain companies? Um, how can, how can they say, perhaps increase their chances for landing an interview? Okay, my general advice for someone looking for employment is cast a wide net. You know, don't just apply one place or two places, even though you really want to go to these places. Cast a wide net. You never know what you'll catch. And um, uh, the other thing is, if you're ex an experienced person, you should have created value for yourself by then and you should have built a network. And that's where people will know you. Um, if you reach out to them looking for an opportunity, you should have more leverage and, and uh, higher chances of opportunities uh, being closed. If you're a more junior person and you're just starting out, then yes, it's a bit more difficult to rely on a network. Uh, but again, you need to cast a wide, na wide net. Do not uh, do not give up. You have to be. You have to persevere. You know. Um, uh, I was, as I was telling you when I came back from Australia, um, although be it, it was only two months until I got my job, um, I was panicking. Uh, I was stressed, and I was getting the wrong advice from the wrong people. Um, so this is another thing. Don't wrong ever take advice about your job. No, about the recruitment process. Uh, yani, then I was just a fresh grad and I didn't know anything about the job market, right? Of course. So, and this is general principle in life is don't ever ask for advice from the wrong people. Uh, the wrong people being one, they could be uh, ill-informed or not knowledgeable enough to give you useful information. Or two, they could not want the best for you and they could be malicious people. So yeah. be careful from both types. Uh, they will lead you astray. So. Um, all I, uh, and I, through that storm of confusion and doubt that I had in the beginning, I kept my head down, I kept moving forward, I cast a wide net, I looked at all the major websites, I uploaded my CV, um, I went to all the career fest uh, festivals or uh, events or whatever, um, I, I used my network even though I was a fresh graduate, you know, so I, I did everything. You have to be really, um, how to say, uh, and you have to really persevere. You have to be uh, resourceful not, and looking for a job. And you have to be resilient uh, and avoid the negativity. Uh, this is my advice. Don't give up. You know, yes, sometimes these websites, the people don't check. Sometimes these career fairs are useless. Sometimes the network will not do anything for you. But if you throw a big enough net, you'll catch something sooner or later. And I kind of have to agree with you, networking is the best way to get a job. Uh, and, and the more you network, the more you attend events, the more um, we know that perhaps people are asking, how can I network within in confinement when there's lockdown, when there is, you know, the coronavirus. But there are so many um, uh, platforms and, and virtual networking events taking place. I know that we have thrown so many networking events now. Um, today I was attending the HR Summit and it's a virtual networking event. So if you really want to network, you will find the time and you will find uh, the platform and the resources. So look for these opportunities. Network in the industries that as, uh, that you're looking for a job in. So if you're trying to find a job in e-commerce, you're not going to network with the travel and tourism um, you know, fields. So, uh, kind of leverage the network around you also and ask for advice from people within these sectors. There's another thing here, uh, um, you need to be aware of the economy that you are part of. So you need to understand where the job trends are going, which industries are investing, which in industries are retracting, uh, where is the investment happening, where is the government support happening, which sectors are growing, which ones are declining. You need to be aware of the market situation. 
and accordingly you can you know focus your energy there i mean during corona for example uh, e-commerce became very big so anyone who tried to go into e-commerce has experienced a high level of success um, you know when, when oil prices are down you don't go look for opportunities in oil you know you have to use common sense um, uh, it's about getting a degree or certification or looking for a job always be aware of where the trend is going where is the growth where is the retraction happening I think the most important thing that you need to research the market, like Rashid said, research the market, learn more about these industries, follow them, follow their news on Twitter, on Instagram, on, on LinkedIn, and um, try to learn, I mean, everything that you can about these job industries. Are they recruiting? Are they not? Uh, this is part of your job search strategy. Uh, and I think commonly people, they fail to research the companies, they just apply everywhere, and uh, they don't prepare prepare questions or prepare, you know, uh, anything that is going to help them uh, in their uh, search. Um, going to crafting the right story, uh, a lot of the people go to an interview and going back to the interview setting. A lot of people go to the interview and um, perhaps answer questions with yes, no, and without crafting the right story. Uh, what is the most valuable thing? I know that we touched on interviews before and the preparation, um, mm -hmm. but if there is one advice that you were going to give uh, the candidates uh, that are going to an interview today, uh, other than being you know, um, themselves and, and that, what would you tell them to do in addition to preparing, practicing, and being authentic? Uh, what is one more thing that uh, you would like to add in terms of interviewing? Yeah, the more senior a person is, the less they want to listen. And, you know, so you have to be very concise. You know, their time is worth a lot of money and they cannot uh, give you their full attention all the time. So if you lose them in the first few minutes, it's bad. And that's why you need to really master the way you articulate things. Uh, so being very concise in your speech is an art you know you can say the same thing in one minute or in 100 minutes you know uh, i mean in different levels of detail but you need to be able to gauge interest and this is a, this is a soft skill that's very hard to get by some people don't have it they yes. can keep blabbering on without any awareness of the receiving and losing interest so if you have this awareness when you are communicating then you are going to be a king <laughs> it's, it's also important, Rashid, uh, to, to, to know how to narrate, communicate your story. Yeah. And, and the communication skills is something that, I mean, it's either that people have it or they can learn it. So um, uh, we find that a lot of people, perhaps they don't want to invest in themselves and in learning. But we also see that there's a lot of people who, especially now during the COVID, we've seen yeah. that there are tons of online courses taking place uh, on Coursera, Future Learn, Udemy, a lot of these courses. Would you recommend that candidates, uh, for instance, they take some of these courses like a communication course or uh, any other of these courses? And would you look, would you value these short uh, online courses when somebody comes to you and he tells you during the this pandemic I've learned uh, these three courses I've polished my communication skills would you value these in, in, in a candidate and uh, do you think that people should continue to learn as part of their journey definitely uh, Iba, uh, I would never tell anyone not to continue to learn so you need to uh, nurture the academic side uh, always read um, engage yourself in courses, read books. Um, I try my best even on the road to listen to audio books to make use of this time that we are, that, that you know, that's very precious to us. Um, but I think one of the most important things in communication is demonstrating understanding. So if you have not invested in the time to learn a, a subject, you will come off as uh, very shallow and no one would want to listen to you. So yes, you need to have that storytelling ability that may come either from nature or nurture, but also invest in the time to adequately learn a subject. Um, and and that's, that will give you an edge and that will make people want to listen to you. Yeah. yeah. 
We have a question from Patricia. She's asking, um, you mentioned certain skill sets are important from abroad. Do recruiters search locally first to come to that conclusion or are companies uh, kind of set on getting potential employees from ab abroad? So do they no, look I mean, for, for local talent or do they uh, instantly go and, and uh, look for talent from perhaps uh, outside or globally? Again, it depends on what you're hiring for. So uh, let's say a certain job role is um, quite common in the UAE and there are established industries and people with, high, with a lot of experience. Um, so that's why you would look in the local market. But if there's a new industry here that's not so new outside, that's where you prefer to get someone from outside with more experience. So, I mean, it's yeah, it's not black and white. Depends on the job and the industry and the maturity of that industry locally. Um, yeah, I mean, recruiters always prefer to go local. Uh, but if that product is not, there. it's like a product, you know? Think of yeah. a recruiter. We yeah, are like all a, products. I mean, uh, our products. personal brand, we're product to be launched and marketed. That's it. I mean, uh, there aren't any, let's say there aren't any UAE made cars. So of course I will go look for a car outside the UAE and bring it here. <laughs> you know, it's the same, the same principle, Tara. Of course, of course. Um, if perhaps this question is related to the job market, how do you describe the current job market now, uh, perhaps during COVID-19? How do you find it? Is it challenging for, find, for finding a job? And what is your advice for people who are looking uh, to find jobs? I think we've tapped on these uh, uh, subjects before. Yes, yes. Well, look, Hiba, um, 10 years ago when I started my career, I also heard the same things. Oh, we are in a crisis. Oh, there. Every now and then, and every decade, there is a crisis. There is a bull market. There is a bear market. Uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's something that will never end. Um, the key is, as I said before, look at where the trends are. You know, where the growth is happening. Let's say in COVID-19, yes, it was challenging. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of industries closed down. A lot of restaurants, uh, hotels. Uh, you know, airline industry is suffering. A different, you know, retail, uh, hospitality, a lot of different sectors are suffering. But again, e-commerce boomed. So as one door closes, another opens. And you need to know where these doors are opening. So yeah. always look at what's the upside of these uh, crises and what was born because of them. So suddenly, because of this crisis, digital transformation became very important. And this sector is booming now with the software development, with solutions, with systems. So that's one sector. The e-commerce side, as I said before, is booming. The, the medicine, the online food, the, you know, all the critical things suddenly became more important. So that's where the focus shifted. So as with anything in life, you have to be very aware of your surroundings and be flexible enough to adapt and pivot as you go along. So. Yes, Yanni. Yeah, so it's a highly valued uh, skill that you keep mentioning, being flexible and yes. agile and adaptable. Yes. So change. Change is the key, you know. You need to know yeah. when to change and how to change and having that attribute with you. All right. So we have another question from Ahmed. Ahmed is asking, do you think COVID-19 pandemic will expedite a global, globally organizations digital innovation and transformation so he's asking that would organizations shift into digital innovation and transfer uh, transformation also what is expected resistance to change from employees due to this quick transformation so absolutely. first of all what is, yeah yeah absolutely um, this is the trend and it's very apparent and the fact that our even our project and mandate was given during this crisis is a testament that the governments are willing to invest in such initiatives and even the private sector. So yes, that, that sector is growing and due to the COVID, the thing is expediting. Um, what was the second question? The second question is, do you expect that employees are going to resist this uh, digital transformation? I mean, you always have a group uh, people within any organization that will resist and it's mainly going to be the, 
the types that uh, have always been resistant to change, whether they are old or young. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a personality it's a feature. It's a mentality, you know? Yes, I mean, statistically, maybe it's more predominant with the older generations who are used to doing things in a certain way. But uh, I've seen very old people adapt quickly to technology. And, and perhaps in uh, some other countries, um, the older generations are very comfortable with technology by now. Um, digital transformation and development happened a bit later in our region, yeah, albeit the UAE is probably one of the leaders in the region. Uh, for, uh, yes, you'll always find these types, but it's, again, it's survival. If you, are, if you are in that bucket, then you are doomed to, to not survive, you know? Absolutely. Trying to see, there are so many questions. Um, I know that I won't be able to answer them all. So perhaps before we still have uh, about five minutes, four minutes, um, what is your last advice to everyone now? Uh, perhaps anything related to their careers, to their job search, and uh, look into the current market. What would be your top advice to all these people? And that would be our uh, wrap-up question. Okay, I would say understand your value and build on top of it. Don't try to compensate your weaknesses. And once you understand that and you, you harness that power that you have, then you'll be able to market yourself better. You'll be able to be known by others and to be counted on. And any opportunity that comes will come your way because people know who you are and what you're good at. So build that reputation. Understand what you're good at and keep, keep harnessing that power. Um, discovering yourself and, and discovering what you're good at can take a lifetime, you know. But um, invest in the time, you know, try different things, educate yourself, make mistakes, it's fine. Uh, and once you get that spark up, ah, I'm good at sales, for example, start building on top of that and excel. Uh, that's, that's, that's my main advice, because a lot of people are trying to do everything at the same time, or they are being very passive about um, um, building themselves or polishing themselves, you know. Um, and and that will that will lead to a life of mediocrity. So you'll be a very mediocre person if you don't keep polishing yourself in the right direction. And don't settle for toxic environments. Don't settle for a job that just pays the bill. Um, if you're not passionate about what you do, then there's a problem. You need to pivot. So keep the final message is keep pivoting. Keep pivoting until you reach what you want to reach. Great. Thank you so much, Rashid, for the discussion today. Great uh, takeaways uh, from you. Uh, and I hope that you all have enjoyed this and uh, just taken note into, you know, uh, some of the top uh, skills, some of the top uh, things that you need to do in order to find a job. So you need to be able to pivot. You need to be able to have the right mindset. You need to be able to have to invest in your skills, keep learning, be adaptable be flexible uh, to change. Um, and if you find yourself in a toxic environment, maybe this is not the right place for you. So try to find value in a place where you are appreciated. Focus on your strengths, on your skills, and try to identify these. Because um, knowing yourself would help you really um, stand out and find yourself in any position that you want to. Uh, and, and with this, uh, again, I would like to thank you, Rashid, so much for being with us today. This is the second time we host Rashid. Uh, Rashid was one of our panel speakers on uh, the Career Networking event. Uh, we really valued your input then, and we really value it today. Great insights from you, and we hope to host you again in the future. Uh, thank you so much to our attendees today, and uh, thanks for the questions. I'm sorry for those who I wasn't able to uh, perhaps tap onto their questions. Um, uh, the attendees, they send you their best regards. So uh, thank you all again. Thank you, and have a great evening. And I'll see you again uh, next week with my career talk uh, with our guest speaker on next Tuesday. So have a great evening. Have a great evening, Rashid. Thank you again, and we look forward to hosting you again in the near Thank future. You. Thank you. Sure. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Awesome.